Hello everybody, Ben Woodruff here with another Falconry video. Today's video I want to be talking about occipiters, but specifically if you are thinking of getting an occipiter, I want to go over some considerations about that genus that are pertinent and hopefully will help you make a good choice. Now uh, I know a lot of people watch these videos from all around the world, and I know also a lot of people are new, we're brand new thinking about becoming a falconer or are uh, new into the sport. And so just a little background here, there's kind of three groups we normally see utilized in falconry. Now I can't go species by species with everything in a genus and all the nuances. I'm just giving a little bit of background before we jump into occipiters. So of course the, the, the falcons, where falconry gets its name, uh, most falcons have long pointed wings and a long tail, long skinny toes, and uh, the peregrine falcon is arguably the most iconic member of this family, uh, of this genus, and the saker falcon, um, arguably the longest uh, uninterrupted use in the sport by any species of falcon. Most falcons, especially large falcons, are primarily bird hunters. They're primarily birds of open country. They are birds that use that uh, benefit from the use of a lot of space, from the use of momentum. When they're diving or when they're chasing, having built momentum, they want that momentum to carry them through and they want their prey to absorb the impact of that momentum. That is their Usually, and again, I know there's always exceptions, but that is the primary way that we see falcons utilized. So uh, falcons, that's that genus. Then there's the Budios, which are uh, here in the United States, arguably the red-tailed hawk would probably be the most recognizable or most uh, you know uh, iconic Budio that we have here. Budios in the rest of the world are appropriately called buzzards. I've mentioned in videos before the fact that for whatever reason, uh, European American colonists started calling members of the vulture family, like turkey vultures, they started calling those buzzards, which has led to a lot of confusion in terms back and forth on both sides of the ocean. But a buzzard is a budio, which is a genus of hawks that are soaring hawks for the most part. Most of them have long, broad wings, a very long tail. Most of them have short, stubby, very thick, incredibly powerful toes. And most members of this genus are primarily focused on hunting rodents in the wild if left to their own devices. Now, these do not have as long of a history of use in the sport of falconry, but they have proven their own. And uh, maybe for the sake of convenience, I will lump in Harris Hawks into that as well. Although Harris Hawks are classified as parabudios, they're kind of a, a side branch of this genus perhaps. But the important thing to remember is uh, I view a Falcon as a high performance race car, fast, flashy, needs special gasoline, always breaking down, all kinds of considerations. I think of buzzards, bootios, as Jeeps and as trucks. They're not as fast, they're not as flashy, but they're good to get the job done. That's kind of my attitude. And don't get me wrong, bootios can be very fast, uh, but it, it takes more encouragement, training, and conditioning to get them honed in on, say, oh, we're going to go hunt rabbits, right? Then we have the eagles, and there's eagles and hawk eagles and fish eagles, but I'm just going to simplify and I'll say aquila eagles. Um, the genus aquila is the true eagles, like the golden eagle is the gold standard, right, for this, for this genus. These eagles are glorified budios in some way, but much brainier in my opinion, and with a little bit of goshawk in there perhaps. Uh, I've I've done videos where I say, hey, if you ever want to train a golden eagle, flying a ferruginous hawk, which is a budio, and a goshawk, which is an occipiter, and a jeer falcon, that those three will best prep you, not in terms of size, but in terms of learning how their mind works. But either way, the point of it is that, is that a golden eagle, structurally, is built like a giant buzzard, right? Long, broad wings, long tail, comparatively short, thick, powerful feet. They're not short, but 
you know, compared, you know, if you had a falcon the same size as a golden eagle, that falcon's toes would be much longer, much skinnier. And they're a very diverse hunting uh, in, in, in terms of what the prey is going to be going after. The golden eagles in Spain primarily hunt tortoises, which they catch and drop from the sky and crack open. Sad for the tortoise. Uh, some of them hunt uh, members of the bighorn sheep family and mountain goats and deer. Uh, locally, most of ours like to key in on on uh, just like jackrabbits and cottontail rabbits. That's a, a good food source. But um, I mean, my the smallest golden eagle I've ever flown caught three coyotes by accident. So they're they're diverse and they're they're capable hunters. But the, but again, and and I'm not going to get into owls. I'm saying if you go around the world, if you're new to falconry, these are the three or four genuses that we normally see: falcons buzzards or budios and eagles especially aquila eagles okay and then there's occipiters so occipiters first let's talk about the good occipiters they exist on another plane and where did they come from it's funny you should ask random viewer because it turns out that the 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 the, the deepest darkest depths of the underworld could not handle the wrath of the occipiters, and the Lord of Darkness spat them up into the mortal realm to wreak havoc upon this world. Or something like that. Uh, you know, in truth though, I will say, occipiters, their mind processes different. All birds have a frame rate and a reaction time that is snappier, much more quick than us or, or many other animals. But occipiters, in particular, just you just watch watch their head move, watch their eyes, watch just everything that twitches, everything about them. They process so much more quickly. If you have a chance, go online and try to look up videos of goshawks going through obstacle courses. Many people, I know, I think National Geographic did one, but many other people have as well. And just watching them go through things that you know they'll put up bamboo posts that are you know a few this far apart. And the goshawks with their huge, you know, three, four foot wingspan are coming through. And without missing a wing beat, they have it timed perfectly to tuck in and slide through and keep going as if they weren't even there. All raptors do have, all true raptors do have fast reflexes, but occipiters, it takes it to another level. And this uh, bleeds over into their flight style and their hunting. All occipiters have comparatively short wings this allows them to dodge brush and be very very quick but the shorter your wings the faster you have to flap in order to stay airborne take a look at ducks for example for their size they have very small wings and they're incredibly fast but their wings are deep they're very broad so not only does shorter wings require you to flap faster to stay airborne they also give you the gift of making minor changes each flap okay so if you're like flap flap oh i need to turn flap if you're going you can just each flap is an opportunity to make adjustments and that is why when you see the hunting of and again i know there's always exceptions if you see a buzzard a budio or an eagle usually they're fairly direct flights and you might have some last minute turns when you watch a sippeter's hunting it is very literally like a cartoon it's like some old Tom and Jerry cartoon, just doo -doo 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 -doo, all over the place. It's amazing. They have a, a much longer tail than other birds their size. And their wing loading is ridiculously low. What that means is the amount of mass, bone, structure that they actually have, it's nothing compared to the size of their wings. This, again, also gives them more buoyancy, which they don't usually use for gliding much. It's more that they can doo -doo 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 turn. And so if you're going to think of, if you think of like an eagle as a lion, and if you think of buzzards, budios as like, you know, a big, you know, big leopard or something like that, right? You got to think of your occipiters as maybe like a cheetah, very, very specialized and in the brush, flash and dash and come out. That's very different than you have with these other more cut and dry raptor species. Their agility is unparalleled. Occipiters will do, 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 miss, hit the ground, and then and as their prey gets away, nope, and then come back do, do, and still catch it. They will crash through the brush. 
the denses brush dive into the water after their prey like it's nothing they just pound on in the that's incredible and basically every flight you fly if you fly in a sipiter will take your breath away it really is gonna be like whoa oh national geographic would have killed to have that on film because it's just it's so truly remarkable but the thing is even though there's these amazing things there's a lot you have to consider okay now i recognize all around the world people get into falconry for different reasons there's people who get into it for a love of the bird a love of the hunt somebody who's an old hunter who's seasoned and wants to find a new more challenging form of hunting all different reasons i understand that i'm not here to preach at its most fundamental level falconry is hunting with a trained raptor you're you're training that raptor to build trust with you and finding prey and letting it hunt okay i that's that's kind of the core of what falconry is whether that's with a captive bred bird a bird you raised from a baby a bird you trapped as a migrating first year bird whatever it may be that's kind of the essence of what falconry is i understand it's 2021 and most falconers live in situations in the world where they have to have a job of some kind, some sort of income that uh, to keep a roof over your head. Falconry doesn't put food on the table. Well, let me rephrase that. Falconry can very put, wonderfully put food on the table, but it's probably not going to put a roof over your head. Okay. And so with, with that in mind, your choice of bird is factored in to that equation. How much time do you have to fly to your bird? If you want to fly a falcon, is there open country nearby that you can fly without it running into power poles or getting shot illegally by somebody? Is there game for it to hunt that's readily accessible that is appropriate for the bird you have? So I've said this in other videos, there's all kinds of factors to go through. But accipiters, let's talk about some specific ones. Accipiters are meant to hunt, 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 non-stop day in day out you can even train them to hunt prey in the dark they they just want to hunt non-stop a, a good way if you are a student of biology and you're familiar with weasels that any member of the weasel family almost all members of the weasel, you know weasels pine martin mink uh you know all you know badgers wolverines most of these are possessed with an incredible desire to hunt ridiculously high metabolism and small, willing to tackle much larger prey. And so that's what I think of accipiters as, is like the avian version of the weasel family, where it's like, kill, 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 energy, nonstop energy, blah, that's what they're like. And that is not conducive to everyone's situation, right? If you have a well-trained falcon or a well-trained budio or a well-trained eagle, in the off time, they're perched, they're sitting there like, okay, hey, hey, it was some good flights today, I'm just chilling. You doing good? Yeah, you like that flight? Great. Okay, I'm just perching here. I'm gonna fluff up and relax. And the equipment that we've developed for falcons, budios, eagles, just is flawless. The, you know, we, we've we've fine-tuned the right kind of jesses, the right kind of hoods, the right kind of leashes, the right kind of swivels, and the right kind of perches, and the right kind of bath pants. So it's very easy to keep up your husbandry properly on falcons, budios, and eagles. Not so with accipiters. Accipiters like, I always have energy. Blah! Now, I know you can have accipiters have their calm moments, and I've had many where okay they're fluffed up they're doing good they've, they've got a full crop they've had a bath and they're doing good but my point is the length of the legs the the this the the length of where you find the joints on the legs if they twist the length of the tail and comparative uh, brittleness of their feathers uh all these things the fact that they don't like to be hooded it is hard to properly hood train an occipiter and they can come to resent it all of these things make the husbandry of these birds difficult also in the off season if you're not hunting them what are you gonna do they don't do well in a regular mew uh you probably need something very long and skinny that they can fly back and forth with that pent-up energy uh while they're molting while they're growing in new feathers and not everybody has the space to do that to do some giant long skinny mew and during the hunting season you really need to be hunting every day and not just phoning it in to fly in a scimitar properly you need to put some legitimate time about every single day i understand that is the goal with all falconry with all birds but i'm saying if you miss a day or two with the falcon miss a day or two with a with a red-tailed hawk 
miss a day or two with your golden eagle. They're going to be a little less out in shape, but they're going to be like, oh, cool. All right. I'm glad we're going hunting today. You miss a few days with an occipiter, they are going to take that out on you. And there are ways, I've done videos going a little bit over it, but there are ways to properly manage the aggression issues that can arise in occipiters. But it's there. It's there nonetheless. And you need to be so cautious and mindful of that. Occipiters can be very unforgiving when it comes to holding a grudge. You make a mistake with a falcon, a booty, or an eagle, and uh, you fix the mistake and have two, three, four sessions where you are doing whatever you did wrong the correct way, they usually just roll with it. Occipiters may never forgive it. And forever after you did something wrong and while well, you happen to be wearing a purple shirt, now anytime they see purple, ah, you may have that happen. That's, that's not good. That's not good. So these are some of the considerations. You have a bird that probably isn't going to hood well, even if you do proper hood training. They probably are won't hood well and very well likely may resent the hood. They are going to have pent up aggression. They need to be hunted constantly. And these are things to factor in. There is no any, the, the, usually people do like a swiveling ring perch, but it's still not perfect. There is no perfect muse, in my opinion. I know somebody else are like, what I have set up the works great. Cool. Share it in the comments down below. Let everybody else watching this video benefit from it. In my opinion, there's no 100% perfect housing situation, perch situation, or equipment situation for occipiters. Uh, they're heavy baiters. We've tried bungee cord leashes that have bungee woven in so that there's less strain on the legs. Uh, some people say, well, I'm going to do a, a an anklet that is wider. So there's less, so that so any tension after a bird baits is dispersed more evenly. But then that's heavier and clunky, and that can get in the way because they're so diminutively built. Even a goshawk, even a huge female finished goshawk, is diminutively built compared to a red-tailed hawk of the same length and dimensions. All of these things have got to be factored in. So if you are considering an occipiter, it's a good choice if as a hunting companion. One thing I would say you would be wise to only fly the one bird. So if you already have a bird and you're like, I'm thinking of getting a goshawk, maybe get rid of that bird before you get a goshawk. You don't have to, a person can fly multiple birds or pace out when and how and where. But it is very wise if you're flying an occipiter to only focus on that occipiter and give it its all because it's going to need it. Because it will hunt all day, every day if you give it the chance and just keep hunting successfully, hunting successfully. You have to remember they are very hard on their feathers and often will break them. So there's extra consideration like people will do tail guards that fold over the tail when they're not being flown or when they're on a kill. Uh, a tail guard to fold over it. If you look through my videos, I've got a, another video that has a clip that can also be used for that. But that's something you don't worry about. With a Harris hawk, they spread their tail and the, that whole tail fanned out when they're on a kill. Their feathers are so bendable and so so pliable, so flexible that it doesn't matter. But occipiters break their feathers easily and you need good feathers to be able to properly hunt. So I also, occipiters have switches that turn on and off. And I've, I've done videos going a little bit into that as well. But what switches are is instead of just like, oh, we've built trust. It's like if there's something in their head and they're just like, I will kill anyone and anything. I'm on my quarry. If you come within 20 feet, I will leave the quarry, run up to you, climb up your leg and bind to your face. And they're all of a sudden, all of a sudden you see... Mm, the switch goes off and you could walk up and pick him with a bare hand. And it's like, what is that all about? With a falcon, with an eagle, with a bootio, you're just building the trust. And as the relationship builds just in a linear way, like you would with a dog, then it's like, okay, they trust. We're good. We, we've we been conditioned to uh, understand each other. Not occipiters. Occipiters are switches. And so again, if you're thinking of flying an occipiter, I would recommend you find someone who has already done so, who can kind of help point out these little things along the way. So just to kind of wrap this up again, I wanted to, to extol their virtues, but also remind people that during this, uh, this upcoming season, you're gonna see a lot of occipiter flights uh, with some of my friends and I. And as we show these, they're exciting. 
they're inspiring and they get you jazzed to be like, oh, maybe, maybe I want to go fly a Cooper's Hawk. But I wanted to preface this entire hunting season with that, with some of these facts that you understand that a, an occipiter is a much more intense experience all the way around. It, you, you have to troubleshoot constantly. You, in my opinion, you never reach the proper weight, you never reach the proper level in training. It's just you're constantly moving. It's like driving on a road with a steering wheel that has too much play in the wheel. And you're like, okay, okay, all right, all right okay, cl all right, close. That's what flying an occipiter is like. Even if you make it look good, and even if, you know, there is still troubleshooting the entire time to a very intense level. So, I encourage people to fly occipiters. I fly them myself. I love them of all types. I think they're amazing. But just think things through before getting one. Any any person getting into falconry, of course, would be wise to uh, give some thought and consideration to any choice. But occipiters, again, just infinitely more so. You you will see that a lot of people fly peregrines, sakers. Harris hawks, red-tailed hawks. A lot of people fly all these birds. Notice that you don't see gobs and gobs of people flying goss hawks, cooper's hawks, and sharpshin hawks, or other occipiters from around the world. Those numbers are much lower. And the reason is because there's an understanding. You can't just totally, you know, skip out on hunting and not expect to have violence and excessive vocalization and aggression. And so that needs to be factored in. So think things through, do your research if you're doing an occipiter, and if you are, do it right, and you will, you will, you will tear it up. It, you will have such an amazing experience if you do it right. So I hope uh, this doesn't scare you off from occipiters too bad. I hope it gives you a little bit of info about the good and the bad about them. Uh, let me know if you have any questions about occipiters down below. Please hit subscribe if you haven't already. It really does help me build this channel up. And as always, happy hawking.